Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Young. I'm one of the EMIM1s. Uh, first, uh, my talk is going to be about facial nerve blocks. Uh, first thing I want to just, you guys could have a moment to think about is, what if you saw this person or this child in the ER? What were the different thoughts you would have? And as a medical student, when I first saw lack, I'd be like, oh, yes, this is perfect. Like, this is my time to shine. I'm impressed my attending and I'm gonna get an awesome slowly. And as a resident now, I'm just like, oh my God, when am I gonna ever have time to do this? <laughs> There's so many people waiting. I'm gonna be stuck in this room, like this crying kid, what am I gonna do? And then uh, I'm assuming as an attending, it's probably like, oh, it's, it'll get done and I'll go and be like, oh, it's good job. And then we'll send the patient home. <laughs> That's my assumption. Um, but I think this, this talk is um, what I was thinking about. I was on the PGM block and I have a kid myself and I was thinking, you know, what are the different approaches? I think there's having a diff uh, wide repertoire is always good, um, especially being the ED. So just some talking points uh, I'm gonna go through is the benefits of nerve blocks versus uh, local, uh, what type of anesthetics we use and certain text techniques, tips and tricks that we can go over. So just going over the benefits of a nerve block. Um, yeah, Harry Potter might be really cool with his scar but I don't know if your parents, the parents would be happy or the kid will be happy if you give them one of these. So uh, just some benefits. Um, if you have a really large laceration, um, having fewer injections is always nice to have. Um, one big problem I noticed when I was a med student and I would always use local because I didn't know anything about nerve blocks uh, was the decrease, uh, having a lot of distortion of the wound edges, especially on the face and just having a really hard time approximating the wound edges and it would just look really bad, honestly. Um, otherwise, you also have an increased surface area of anesthesia uh, while doing a nerve block. So talking about anesthesia, um, hopefully it never ever gets to this point when you're doing a laceration or, or doing a nerve block. But uh, the types of anesthetics we kind of think about are lidocaine and bupivacaine. Um, to be honest, I probably have most of my experience with lidocaine. I, I don't think I've ever used bupivacaine before. But uh, just to talk about the differences between these. Oh, um, yeah. So there's three major distinctions. Um, certain is the onset time, the duration of the anesthesia, and the max dose. Um, so if you look at lidocaine, it's, um, it takes a shorter amount of time and it lasts a shorter amount of time. So you can think about an hour to two hours. Bupivacaine, it's going to take a little bit longer, but it's going to last a lot longer. Um, it's also you, a thing I'd never thought about until recently is about max dosing as well. Um, so it's also when you're thinking about a big laceration or you're doing multiple lacerations or uh, you're using topical anesthetics, it's important to consider the max dosage. And I didn't include epi, but um, you know, we, we kind of think about epi as well, like using it on the face. You know, some people are worried about, you know, their theor theoretical risk of getting like nerve ischemia or tissue ischemia. But according to this uh, study, there wasn't any complications. And when I was in pediatrics, you know, we use a lot of let and that has epinephrine in it as well. So, uh, but it's up to you guys, what are you available with and what you're comfortable with. Uh, but also Lido with epi also has a different, um, max dose, which is like seven milligrams per kilogram. But moving forward, uh, just considering the anatomy of the facial structures that were uh, that are available is the ophthalmic region, the maxillary and the mandibular. Uh, these are the nerves that uh, we're kind of targeting with our nerve blocks. So a good way to think about is that line that goes through the pupil uh, just helps us to think about some landmarks. Uh, I just started with the video first. Health is quite simple, and the anatomy can be palpated to ensure correct location. The goal is to target anesthesia in the area around the facial nerve selected, which is why this procedure is more of a regional block. The tools you need for this procedure include topical anesthetics such as viscous lidocaine, local anesthetic, we recommend 1 to 2% lidocaine or bupivacaine, a 25 or 27 gauge needle with syringe, and a cleaning substance of choice if you decide to use an approach through the skin. We will cover the most common regional blocks of the face, including the supraorbital nerve, infraorbital nerve, mental nerve, and auricular nerve. In order to identify the approach for the supraorbital block, have the patient look straight ahead, drawn a visible line from the pupil to the eyebrow, 
enter into the skin and inject two to three mLs of anesthetic. You can draw the needle back almost to skin and redirect medially and inject another few mLs to help anesthetize the supratrochlear nerve. With this approach, you will achieve anesthesia to most of the forehead of that side and some of the nose. This block can be particularly helpful when there is a laceration through or around the eyebrow. For this, you can direct the needle through the laceration and aim towards the spot that you have identified above the pupil. For the infraorbital block, draw an invisible line from the pupils downward and locate the infraorbital foramen, which will feel like a divot. There are two approaches to the block, intraoral or superficial. We recommend the intraoral approach. First, place topical anesthetic roughly where you'll be entering intraorally. Aim for above the maxillary canine. You may need someone to help you hold the lip. The needle should be inserted at the tip of the gum line and angled toward the previously palpated foramen. The goal is to aim for the foramen, but inject a few ml of anesthetic right next to it. If you have a particularly active child, you can ask someone to help by holding a tongue depressor just superior to the infraorbital foramen so that your needle can't pass the foramen and get too close to the globe. For the mental blocks similar to the supra and infraorbital blocks, draw an invisible line from the pupil down just below the canines or premolars of the mandible. For some patients, this foramen can be palpated from the outside. We recommend an intraoral approach with similar technique to the infraorbital block. The auricular block will require two approaches, inferior and superior, which will provide anesthesia to the majority of the ear except for the meatus and the conga. For the superior approach, have the needle at a 45 degree angle anteriorly and inject a few mLs of anesthetic. Then without completely withdrawing the needle, redirect it in the opposite direction and inject a couple mLs. You want to do the same thing immediately inferior to the ear to complete. So that's the video. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, most of them except for the auricular block. I just included it just so you know you have another option if you're dealing with that oh, side as well. And the anatomy can be palpable. Okay. So the first uh, block that we're going to go over is the supraorbital and the supratrochlear uh, nerve. So as the video mentioned, um, if you try to palpate your um, the orbital rim, um, you could kind of feel it around your eyebrow. And then if you use the pupil as a landmark as well, you could draw a straight line. And then you could use that to insert uh, your anesthetic for the supraorbital nerve. And then if you go medial, you could uh, block the supratrochlear nerves. So blocking both of these nerves will provide anesthesia for most of the forehead up to the vertex of the scalp. And as the video mentioned, some parts of the nose as well. Um, as just some tips is having the patient look straight ahead, otherwise the pupil won't be in the middle and you can't, it's hard to use that as a landmark. And if you just uh, palpate around yourself as well, you could kind of uh, get a general idea. Um, going on to the next one. So there's two approaches for the infraorbital nerve block. Uh, we're also using a similar uh, landmark is your pupil. And then you're also palpating the inferior rim of uh, the orbital rim. So you could go through them uh, intraorally or superficially. Uh, I think most people, actually this is probably dependent on people, but uh, some people would not want a needle that close to their eye. Um, so some people will choose to go to the in intraoral approach. Um, a good landmark inside the mouth is using the premolars and uh, sort of uh, angling and pointing the needle towards that inferior rim of the orbital rim. Um, or uh, you could also uh, use the superficial approach where you just palpate it and then you could just insert and then uh, administer the anesthetic. And this provides um, anesthesia to the sensation to the lower lid, the medial cheek, the side of the nose and the upper lip as well. As far as the mental and inferior alveolar nerve block, the mental nerve, uh, we could also continue to draw that line, feel for the mental foramen, and then go through uh, intraorally using the premolars on the bottom of the mouth and then insert as well. Uh, the one that's kind of hard to visualize with a picture was the inferior alveolar uh, nerve block, but uh, this one goes all the way back in the mouth and it's, uh, you could sort of see it on this picture as well. Uh, I know we're talking a lot about lacerations, but I heard a lot, you know, this is also really effective for people who are having dental pain as well. Um, just until, so you could use like bupivacaine for a dental block and hopefully they'll make it to dental clinic by that time. Uh, they won't complain of pain. Um, so just in general and very quickly, um, just to sum up the talk is choosing the right anesthesia. 
I think um, just knowing how long each anesthetic will take, how much time you have, and uh, just the max dosage of each one, just being able to mentally calculate that in your head and just realizing and being more aware of how much you're administering to your patient. Uh, the second part is knowing the anatomy. I think, you know, as long as you have a basic idea of what region you're actually uh, looking forward to anesthetize, you could, you know, look it up very quickly or um, try to palpate yourself and just give yourself some time to think about the different types of um, oper like rep other um, opportunities to use. You could just use local or you could use the nerve block as well. And otherwise, uh, hopefully, if you anesthetize your patient enough, uh, you'll have a happy kid in the papoose. I don't think I've ever seen that happen, but you know, you know, we could dream. So hopefully uh, this will give you some tips on how to have a different approach to different lacerations or uh, dental pain uh, that we'll see in the emergency department. So that's uh, my presentation. If there's any questions or anything else? Yes.